in here listening to the Zoom. So today we have two speakers, both from Virginia Tech. One is Rolf Mueller, who will be going first, and the second speaker is Mike Rowan, who will be going second. So they're both going to be talking about environmental acoustics as related to bath sonar. So before I turn it over to Rolf, I want to remind everybody of our on-site symposium, May 29th here at Brown. The registration is open. Please register, even if you don't plan to give a presentation. And But we hope to see everybody here at Brown. So I will turn it over to you, Rolf. Okay, thank you very much, Andrea. Let me see if I can share my screen now. Okay, looks good. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. So thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, maybe I should start by saying that if we are talking about the acoustic environments of bed biosona, we should really use the plural, that's right, so acoustic environments, because there's about 1,200 bed species with sonar, and they have very different lifestyles and live in very different habitats and also have then very different um, acoustic environments. So there is bats that pursue their prey, that fly around in the open air space. I don't know, can, can you see my cursor? Probably not that much, right? so in the upper left right there of this graph, you can see a bat that is in the open air space. And that's probably a very simple acoustic environment. In right? any blip that you see on your sonar screen, that means dinner. So that's very easy and we probably, 20 minutes is not a long, talking slot, but I would have a hard time filling that, talking about the acoustic environment of a bed like that. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to talk about the beds that you see in the lower uh, right of the diagram here, where you have beds that are able to hunt in really dense vegetation. And that's a very challenging acoustic environment because now your sonar screen is full of blips all the time. And so how do you make sense of that? So to give you a sense how, um, complicated bed environments are. I'll show you some pictures uh, that a collaborator of mine, Ulmar Graf, has taken from field sites that we were just at in, in, in Borneo, um, in, the, um, in the rainforest there. And these are all sites where, where beds are hunting and you can see how, how, how dense the vegetation there is, how complicated it is. And uh, somehow beds are able to make sense uh, out of these very complicated environments uh, using uh, their biosonar system. So uh, what does it look like? Or what is it like to be a bed in these environments? So we have a little artificial um, biomimetic sonar head. Right? So it's like a bed, but right? the sound comes out of uh, this structure here. So that's like the nose sleeve of a, of a horseshoe bed. And then it's received via these two ears and we have um, uh, actuation, uh, pneumatic actuators to change the shape of these structures. But I won't talk about that. Usually I, I talk about those things, but I, I won't do that today. Uh, but just to give you a sense right, that we can actually receive signals that are very similar of, of what the bed would receive. And so uh, in the last fall, my postdoc, my students, they collected uh, 220,000, a bit more than 220,000 of those images uh, of these echoes. And I'm I'm uh, showing you a few of those here. Don't worry, I will not go through the other uh, 220,000 something uh, that are left. But what you see here is in each of these little spermatozoans, right, the head is the, the Sonar pulse, so that's the mouth. It was not in Borneo, it's on the Virginia campus. You wouldn't be able to figure that out. You cannot see them because the left. We're having a lot of trouble hearing you. Yeah. Okay. I, I I hear I hear you say that. Um, That's much better. Okay. So so is it, am I speaking? Is it too soft or is it just broken up? What? It's broken up. Can you right give me a sense what the problem? 
Uh, yeah, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm currently in China, so the internet connection oh, might not be no. that good. Uh, so, okay. Um, so, so let's just, just try and hope that as people, I mean, it's midnight here, so hopefully uh, I can get more and more bandwidth uh, to bed. Uh, so, um, so, so what bats are able to do is they are able to look at all those little wiggles that you see here in the tail in the tails of those spermatozoans and look at that and understand what their environment is. And that's, that's I've, I think that's quite a feat. Uh, and actually, why, why is it complicated? Right. So the, I think the basic factor here is that bats are really small. Right. So if you see here, the bat, this is, this is the smallest of them all. Uh, right. the, 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 the bumblebee bat in the human hand, right, how tiny uh, this creature is. So, so bats can be really small. Of course, not all bats are that small. There's the other extreme bats that are, are really large for a bat. Um, but compared to, say, a submarine, right, a nuclear submarine, they're still small, right? So I, I took, selected these two pictures where I have a half-naked man as a reference both for the bat and for the submarine. And you can see that the submarine still wins when it comes uh, to size, right? So the submarine uh, is, a, is a lot better uh, when it comes to being large compared to the to wavelength. And that matters, right? If you have a, a sonar system or any emitter, any receiver for a wave, you really have to ask yourself, how big is that emitter or receiver compared to the wavelength? So what I've done here is I have, um, I have uh, taken uh, the beam pattern, right? so the ultrasonic beam of a piston, source and uh, the three different pictures show you what this would look like if the, the wavelength and the size of the piston are the same or then the piston is two times the wavelength or five times the wavelength and you see the larger you get compared to the wavelength the narrower beam you can make of course you're also getting more and more side loops but that's a separate story so you can make a narrower beam when you're large and so the problem is again the beds are small right so here's a graph uh, where my former student brian and, and i we took a lot of um, beam data from bats these were numerical simulations where we had a we have a large database of nose leaf shapes of ear shapes of bats so uh, uh, we, we can predict using like a method their beam pattern is like uh, and and these are all the orange dots here so the curve is the x-axis is again the size of the say the the bed um, relative to the wavelength i mean the, the the ear or the nose leaf of the bed relative to the wavelength and then we have the beam width and so all the orange uh, circles they show you the region where the beds in our sample were and then all the uh, uh, maroon triangles they show you uh, man-made sonars, right? So these were not uh, nuclear submarine sonars because you cannot find that information on the internet, or at least I hope you cannot even attempt to look for it. Uh, but they were they were uh, sonars right, that you can buy for your for your yard or for your fisher, uh, fishing vessel, right? and you can see uh, that those sonars tend to operate much more to the right side um, from the from the beds. Only some really cheap cheap sonars overlap with the bats. So bats are really uh, uh, not that much bigger than the wavelength than they operate at and much, so that maybe at best about the factor 10, I tend to hear. Uh, so bat ear or bat nose leaf is at best 10 times the wavelength uh, that the bat uses, whereas for a, even a, a commercial sonar, you are 100 times larger than the wings that it operates on. Uh, so why is that an issue? Right? So, so the, the problem is now right, that you get these wide beams and uh, within that beam, right, you illuminate a large portion of the environment. And so all the um, uh, locations in space right, that you get an echo from at the same time, right, that's an ellipse. Right? So if you imagine the inset in the top left corner here, right, here's your mouth, and here's your ear. So everything that sits on an ellipse here has the same um, uh, travel distance right, from the mouth back to the target and back. And all the echoes will come back at the same time. Right? So you cannot tell 
say for example in, in this beam in this big picture here what i've done is i've mapped uh, sensitivity uh, so again it's a beam with side loops onto that ellipse and so you cannot tell right what you're getting back is it a small target uh, in a region of high gain or is it a stronger scattering target maybe in a region where the gain is lower but that that so it's, it's, it's an ill post problem right you cannot figure that out but it's like uh, i'm giving you uh, the sum of uh, a few dozen numbers and i'm asking you so what what are the compound numbers right and, and you just can't tell uh, how this is broken up and this is the same problem uh, here and that's the the problem why those tails these little wiggles in the spermatozoans that i showed you um before the echoes were right so hard to make sense of those but right? that that's behind that and that's what the bad the problems that the bats encounter Right. So if you think about that situation in terms of um, biosonar problems, sensing problems that the bat has to solve, right? So if you if you see the world through those wide beams, so so these are again the left and right ear biosonar beam. Not actually they are already in the picture here, much narrower than they typically are for bats. And so one situation that you could have is that you have a deterministic target, right? Like this little ball uh, here in your picture. That would be the situation of a bat that is hunting in open space. So that's a relatively simple problem, but maybe context already suffices, right? So you know you are by yourself up in the open night sky and anything that comes up, it's food. But so that, that's a really simple problem. The other problem um, would be um, that you have a really complex target. So your sonar beam is now bathing in a whole clutter of, of cluster of, of leaves right in the foliage and you get echoes from everywhere so now you have this unpredictable echo right because you just don't know what the situation is how these leaves are arranged right but that's what these bats would encounter that hunt in in, in dense vegetation right when they say they want to navigate but right? they want to evaluate which habitat they are in but right? is that where they want to stay in the night is that where they want to look right so you have to make sense of these very random echoes Right. Um, and uh, then finally you have the situation that you could have a, a complex background or submerged in a complex background but right? in this really need is you need something how this target can stand out right? how it can tell you that it is different from all the other other targets right? and again i'm not don't want to go into this right now, but uh, there's examples for that. But for instance, bats that look for Doppler shifts, CFFM bats, right, where you have a, a moth acting its wing and it's beating its wing so much faster than any of those leaves in the foliage can move. And so they really stand out, and the bat can say, Aha, uh, that's something different here. So these are the, um, the biosonar problems uh, again, the center problem and the, the problem at the bottom, but these are the, the the difficult problems so I'll, I'll talk about the that we that we have on that and, and the first problem that I want to um, talk about is um, how can you actually navigate in an environment like that right so if you think about how do we do robot navigation and one way to do it or autonomous vehicles right in a natural environment one way to do it is to have uh, to use vision right that's what people like to do and uh, then those uh, vision robotics people but they would store a library of images in the robot and then the robot as it moves or the autonomous vehicle as it moves around it would um, it would uh, compare um, those uh, images to to, to the, in the library to what it's getting back and look for some match uh, uh, so if you see a certain shape of a building you know aha uh -huh, this is where you are that and this this determinist having this library of deterministic templates that wouldn't just work for bats. Right? So again, here's an example. On the left-hand side, you see a, an aerial view of a small uh, wooded area um, on the Virginia Tech campus. And uh, the orange line is uh, where uh, my students walked along on that, on that thing and, and so sort of track where they collected the echoes. And then on the right-hand side, you see a correlation matrix, right? Where, so that you see along this track, they collected 5,000 echoes. So the echo number is on the x-axis, is again on the y-axis. And so in each cell of that matrix, we are asking 
how well is that echo correlated? As there's this, so highest value is this yellow, so that would be a correlation of one. You get that along the diagonal, of course, because you're comparing the echo to itself. And everywhere else, you know, there's not much structure, right? It's, it's really all the echoes are there. Sometimes there's some spurious uh, partial correlation, but then there, there, there are no matches other than with itself, right? So if you want to, if the bat wants to remember that path by its echoes, template matching, right, correlation, that's like, a correlation template matching is just two words for the same thing for the same operation but it just won't work right? and you can also think of it that perspective but how, how much to remember so here's another example this is about where we where we moved a, a sonar head and we moved it on a on a segment of a sphere that these are these sort of, uh, shapes here and then this is the correlation coefficient is um, this is on mapped on the surface of the sphere so you see the echo that was in the center that is always this this red uh, bimple here and you see within less than five centimeters the correlation dies down right so i can in other words i can do a template matching within an, an air space a volume that is maybe four and a half centimeter um, cube right that's that's sort of where i can see that one echo so if you imagine say in the in the night a bat would fly over a distance of 10 uh, and it will stay within um, a cross section area of one square meter. So that would be pretty precise in that uh, it's kind of like a tunnel. It's probably uh, not needed, right? So you would have then um, 10,000 cubic meters of air volume. That would be just a 10 to the 4. Then if you imagine about four point something centimeter correlation distance, so within one cubic meter, you would have another about 10,000 positions that give you uncorrelated echoes. So that's another 10 to the four. And then if you imagine maybe there's a hundred different directions that the bats can uh, turn its sonar in, in azimuth and elevation and get different echoes. So that means the bat in this, just in this, this uh, cylinder, uh, of 10 kilometer length, it could be a different act, right? And so if it ever wanted to see possible uncorrelated echoes in its environment, right, and it went at a, at a rate of 10 hertz, it would mean that the, it would take the bed more than 300 years to see all those echoes, right? And that means it would, uh, full, right? if it takes about one third of the day, so works eight hours out of a 24 hour day, like, uh, humans who inhabited office environment typically do right it, it would take it um, about um, about a, a thousand years to do that right so but there, there's hope right you can for instance a long time ago i looked into using statistical parameters right using distribution functions and characterizing um different angles right how, how you can actually how the, the foliage changes from different directions uh, Ming Chen, I don't know if she's in the audience at Brown. She has worked on, on this, this problem by taking a time make a model, leaf size, leaf orientation, and you can pose from that where you also model the sonar beam that's on the right hand side. So you can. So it's Modeling different tree species or from model, but
Hey, Rolf, I, I think everything's frozen. Can you hear me? No, it's gone. Um, if we do not get the speaker back, is the second speaker also in China? No, he's at Virginia Tech. Uh, I'm here in the States. <laughs> well, I wonder if we can, I thought I got control here for him to stop sharing his screen. Um, yeah, can I, can I share again? <laughs> I think he's using auto tune. <laughs> yeah, um, let's see. So he he's not sharing his screen anymore either. <laughs> And maybe we should just move ahead and we can just have him share his slides and post the slides on our website. Sure, that would be fine. Fine by me. So, okay, then I think maybe we should go to the second presentation. <laughs> it's good timing. I mean, it's the right time. Just about, yeah. Okay, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jen. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now I'll try. Sharing mine. Can we see that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah, we see your PowerPoint. Cool. Uh, what a slideshow. Um, Good to know. Yeah. Cool. Um, so um, Rolf was talking quite a bit on the side of the um, bio side, the bats themselves. Um, what I've been working on a little bit. Uh, kind of in my spare time, I guess, <laughs> is um, to uh, start looking at uh, the, the way bats see the world um, as opposed to, ooh, is it, am I muted? Can everybody hear me? No, I muted everyone briefly and then oh. I muted you so we could get rid of the background noise. Okay. Um, is that background coming from me? My, I'm in a very old building, so the pipes go pinging and stuff. Um, so, um, looking at uh, you know what bats do, and then trying to compare that to what we do in uh, man-made sonar. Um, and so, um, I got a little bit of uh, an outline here, uh, you know, a little bit about our lab and what we do, um, and then jump right into uh, major challenges that we see in underwater um, signal processing and sonar. Um, particularly active sonar, which, you know, matches the bats problem. Um, and then look at some waveforms. Uh, today it's really just bats, but I have a few um, mammal ones in there. Hey, I see Rolf back. Um, <laughs> and um, then kind of go into the three regimes and make some comparisons, so like spatial processing, which Rolf had been talking about um, in terms of beam widths um, and how that's all done. Uh, how we as, uh, Humans process echoes uh, compared to what uh, the bats are doing. Uh, a few words about classification that plays into the whole thing uh, and then wrap it up. Um, so a little bit about me since very few um, of you work really, uh, I'm not a bio sonar person, I'm more of a uh, audio signal processing person. Um, so our lab uh, does a whole bunch of work on immersive audio. Uh, we got studios and labs with all kinds of surround sound and um, my lab's there in the middle, uh, since been turned into an anechoic room with 57 loudspeakers in it. Um, and we do all kinds of outreach and things. Your standard acoustic stuff, metamaterials, um, and a lot of live performance things. Uh, so with Meyer Sound, uh, we've been partnering and doing a lot of uh, big uh, concerts and things to like 12 million people on the reach of that thing. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, but my... Uh, Previous work uh, for like 20-ish years was uh, completely in sonar. Um, I posted a link up there, so when I share the slides, you can go and watch a little snippet from the Hunt for Red October uh, and have yourself a good laugh. Uh, well, 
the people who've been doing sonar have a good laugh when they watch that movie because like, oh, the, the torpedoes know right where they're going and, you know, um, they avoid all the clutter and um, they're able to go zooming in right on the target and that never happens, <laughs> well, almost never happens. Um, and the reasons for that are kind of listed here is that, um, you know, the, there's some hard um, limits on what you can do in a system. Um, there's uh, transmit and receive. Um, wideband signals is tough. All the elements that are used are like ceramic, piezo-ceramic type things. Um, and they're, you know, resonators. It's like a vibrating bar, right? Um, so it has a big resonance peak. Uh, and trying to spread that out over a wide band is tricky. Um, although it's getting better. Uh, and then there's no collaboration really, uh, cause there's no communication underwater, um, that we can do, uh, except like a, a modem that you talk about in baud rate, not gigabits. <laughs> um, limited processing power, uh, especially in autonomous systems like mine hunters and torpedoes and that kind of stuff. Um, and then the physical environment is really, really harsh. Um, if you've ever built anything that has to work underwater, um, I did it at the Applied Research Laboratory at Penn State for a decade. I'm just getting all the seals right and everything to work um, more than like an hour is really, really hard. Um, then when you get in the environment, it's kind of our second thing here, challenges. Um, and I kind of want to relate these to like waveforms that are transmitted and that kind of thing because it, it does have a, a role in that um, as to why um, in, in man-made sonar, you use certain kind of waveforms and things. Um, but dolphins and uh, 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 whales, they, they try to, um, well, I guess we're copying from them. It's never the other way around. <laughs> um, and um, so some of the tri tricky things are that the um, sound speed varies with position, um, salinity, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so you can move around and have shadow zones all over the place. Um, in shallow water, there's, which most people are interested in these days in terms of sonar, there's a really high level of reverberation just because you know, you're basically in a channel. Um, there's tons of clutter, rocks and biologics and wrecks and all kinds of crap on the bottom, rocky outcroppings and all that stuff, particularly in the littoral. Um, and then there's very high noise levels. Um, so say you want to do surveillance type stuff with like a 53C sonar, which is that the one on a destroyer that goes ping, ping, ping that you see in the World War II movies. Um, if you're listening back for your echoes um, in a littoral zone and they're shipping all over the place, they're basically like hundreds of giant jammers, like right in where you're trying to do your thing. Um, so very high noise levels within the band um, of interest. Uh, and then the targets, I guess kind of like bugs, you know, they don't want to get caught. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, bugs get eaten and uh, submarines get depth charged and other things, uh, all unpleasant. Um, but so the targets are trying to be stealthy. Uh, they, um, you know, with coatings and um, certain kinds of you know, other approaches that you can use. Um, they're small and, you know, there's smaller, quieter, faster, cheaper, um, and more of them out there. Uh, and um, if you look at, you say, oh, sonar. Well, there's a giant array of problems, right? Are you doing surveillance uh, across hundreds or even thousands of miles? Um, are you trying to find mines, uh, divers that are coming into a harbor? Well, you know, what is your problem? Uh, and there's vastly different waveforms and systems and parameters that go with each one of those. Um, so matching it, matching these things to uh, what uh, like bios like bats do. It's tricky um, because um, there's so many different regimes, you know, low frequency, uh, like explosive chart, all kinds of different um, applications um, that all require different system design. Um, and so, you know, if you start thinking about it in terms of like transmission and receive, Rolf had shown some of this uh, for the bats, you know, like the open air thing, if there's a bug flying around, um, up above all the trees and the bats like up there trying to get it, that problem isn't too tricky. Um, the sonar equivalent of that would be like the deep blue ocean type thing where you have a submarine kind of sitting in the middle um, and uh, it's a deep, deep, deep ocean um, and you're pinging away at it. Um, that, that one's a little bit easier, uh, except, you know, with all the quieting and coatings and all that stuff makes it harder to detect them. Um, but the real problem and the hard ones are, 
of interest are all in what I call the littoral regions that um, it's all shallow water. Um, and so, you know, what you're doing here is you're transmitting um, some kind of source. Um, there's, that's bouncing off the surface, it's bouncing off the bottom um, on its way out to the target, then it hits the target out here. Um, and so it's like a convolution of scattering functions on each step of this uh, process here. So you transmit your nice clean waveform, you get a whole bunch of replicas and selective fading on it because of reverberation. Finally reaches the target, it scatters um, across uh, the um, glints or highlights of the target. Um, and then um, it, on its way back, it could get into all kinds of other trouble um, and you just keep, so if you started out with a direct, like a delta function pulse here, uh, by the time it goes through all these convolutions with these scattering functions, you get back a big, long, you know, multi-pole smeary mess, you know. Um, and so how do you fish the target out of um, that mess? Uh, and so humans, um, one, one way that um, I worked on a little bit, uh, uh, like in, I guess, 1996 or 7, um, was this idea of introducing... Um, a priori knowledge that, that you may have. So like, uh, you know, the signal is gonna be all, you know, you just get that and not much you can do about that. Um, use spatial processing to try to enhance your signal and noise ratio and reduce the reverberation. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the target scattering function, if you kind of know what the target looks like. Um, so if you're searching, say, you know, if you have, I'll put it in bat terminal, if you have a bug and, you know, it has a bunch of body parts, um, and it's like about that long. Well, if I'm looking at it towards its head, it's this long target and it has lower target strength. If it's twisted sideways, it's one big target um, but has very little um, length, right? Um, so if you know about that, you can start looking for that pattern within the mix of all the other stuff that's involved together. And that's called an estimator correlator approach. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of you know, it, the ambiguity function plays into that. So the transmitted waveform is um, what's its time bandwidth product. That's going to tell you um, how resolvent it is in range and Doppler. I, I prefer time scale instead of Doppler because this is all uh, wide band. Um, if you know something about the reverberation scattering, uh, like you can do a probing signal, um, that'll help you out as well. And basically you're trying to decorrelate all of that and get the target out. Um, Here's another picture with the math in it that, you know, you get this received signal, do some spatial processing and whitening. Um, and then, uh, you know, the top path is noise only. The bottom path has the target in it. Um, so you're estimating this target spreading function and then doing a wavelet inner product to get out a detection statistic. Um, and, you know, things that come up in there are um, on this end, spatial processing to enhance uh, SNR. So for us, it's like beamforming. Um, and then uh, waveform selection to have a sharp ambiguity function allows you to resolve the target better uh, so you can pull it out of that mess. Um, so they're all kind of tied together. So first a little bit about spatial processing. Um, we're pretty much limited to arrays. I pulled these all off the internet. I just typed sonar array. Um, and uh, so the, on the really low frequency end, you would have like over here on the left, like SOSUS. Um, from the 70s, um, these first arrays, and, you know, try to detect submarines creeping across um, from the Soviet Union. Um, another suite of sensors that I worked on on these um, destroyers is the uh, 53C sonar. Um, that's an active uh, cylindrical guy up in the front there, uh, and towed arrays, uh, but they're on submarines and towed behind ships and everything. Um, and then Torpedo arrays over here and uh, mine hunters down here. They're, you know, so it's like super low frequency, and then for, as you go from left to right, they're going up in frequency, um, and they have specific applications. You know, you're not going to go hunting um, submarines. Well, not until the very last stage, anyway. You're not going to do surveillance on submarines with a torpedo array because it's well, it has limited range and all that. Um, so we, here's a picture of one I think that was built in Malaysia, I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, these are all the little array elements on there. Um, and, you know, how do we do spatial processing? Well, beamforming. And Rolf talked a lot about this, how um, that's um, uh, our basic, you know, he talked about this uh, 
in reference to the bats. And um, you know, on our end, we can do it on transmission. So this is a picture of that where we put a signal in, adjust the weights and delays, um, and you can steer that beam um, and focus it. Uh, that helps you to reduce um, reverberation because you're searching in one direction and you don't get the re you're transmitting one direction. You don't get reverb from all over the place. Uh, obviously, if it's omnidirectional, it really kills you. Um, and then you can do it on receive as well. So you're you know focusing in these different directions, um, and then it could be adaptive uh, beam forming like MVDR and other ones uh, where you adaptively change these weights uh, to put nulls in the direction of interferes, and uh, you could go all crazy with it. Um, but the bottom line is, is those are resonant elements. Uh, they're, they're not um, really super broadband. And when you do beam forming, it's really only good at a single frequency. Um, I guess you could stack them up with different free. There's a lot of tricks to that, but um, the bats seem to do it all very naturally. And we have to struggle a lot to get, <laughs> to get it to work at all. Um, so our resolution is, uh, is uh, limited. Um, and so it makes it harder to uh, do any kind of classification. Uh, because like Rolf said, that target's completely enveloped by the beam and, you know, what can you see then um, in, in terms of angle? Not much. Um, so, the, so to compensate for that, we try to go up in band, time band with product to give us better range resolution and then try to um, image the target in range. Um, so, you know, the bats on transmit and receive, um, you guys are the experts on this. <laughs> I'm not going to go too deep because that's not my thing um, and I couldn't if I wanted to. But, you know, they got uh, many of them, very good transmitters. Um, I'm kind of more interested on the receive side. Uh, that's just a beautiful object there. Um, and when I see it, I just, um, it screams to me um, uh, spatial diversity um, and, and adapt adaptability. Um, and so uh, here's a, uh, some pictures from Cindy Moss um, about head-related transfer functions uh, as a function of, you know, angle, elevation, and frequency. And, you know, since the bats can adapt um, by changing uh, shape, of, uh, it's changing these head-related transfer functions uh, dynamically. Um, and um, uh, we're getting into the, the, the region of the neuroscience here. It's like, how do you, uh, how do those adaptations help to separate out um, detection, uh, de target detections? Uh, and you know, on the human-based sonar, we don't have anywhere near the diversity uh, to be able to do that kind of um, adaptation. We just have these, you know, basically linear spaced arrays. Um, and, so, and dynamically, you can't change the geometry. You're just stuck with what you have. Um, in terms of uh, transmissions, um, you know, the, these um, FM hyperbolic or uh, LFMs, uh, we see a lot of those uh, in man, uh, man-made sonar. Um, and uh, I mean, the reasons in man-made sonar are so that you have good Doppler tolerance. Um, so you get a good strong correlation across Doppler and also very good range resolution. Because um, if you look at the audio, auto ambiguity function of those guys, um, that's how they look, I picture one. Um, but then there's also adaptation going on um, in both frequency and time. Um, and there's many, many, Jim's written a whole lot about this, um, that, you know, you're in your, in, in, but it, to put it in sonar speak, uh, man-made sonar speak, you're in search mode here, um, and then as you're getting in here, you're getting into homing. Um, and if you watch the uh, movie uh, from The Hunt for Red October, that's why I picked that spe specific clip, because um, as the, as they all start panicking and sweating, like, oh, the torpedo's gonna kill us. Um, you could hear it like, it's, it's not just to stress you out, it actually is, they're, they're speeding up the rep rate um, because you wanna get quicker updates as you home. Um, but also if you cut down on the bandwidth and you lower the energy, it cuts down on your reverberation. Um, and so you can uh, zoom in on the target a lot better. Um, but we see these waveforms all the time as kind of FMs. Um, there's like FSK type waveforms. There's, you know, everything to get a high time bandwidth product, you know, so the bats are using a high uh, bandwidth, uh, shorter time, uh, but the net effect's the same to get a pretty sharp ambiguity function. Um, if you could transmit like white noise, that'd be great. Cause like, um, then you get like really sharp thumbtack um, and you're putting a lot of energy out there. The thing with dolphin clicks and all of that um, in man-made sonar is that uh, the experience has been that if you do clicks and things, their impulses 
Um, there's frequency fading that gets rid of the top end and the animals probably use that as information. Um, but um, our detection range is very limited if we try to use clicks because there's just not enough energy in it, a lot of bandwidth and zero duration. Um, so if you take these signals and zoom in on their um, analysis, this is from that paper again, um, that you can see you have, on the low end here, you have like you know, a lot of duration um, and that gets a, a lot of energy out there across a long period of time um, at a narrower bandwidth um, and you can see the ambiguity function for that. So you're in search, you just wanna see some big um, peaks um, as you get interested in those, you can focus your transmits and um, start beamforming in those directions on receive um, and start upping the resolution on the ambiguity function. And as you get in down the end here, you have really, really good range resolution. Um, and uh, by then there's a lot of tracking going on. So you have like a track trajectory to um, uh, imagine as the bat, you either wanna come up behind it and eat it or intercept it you know, at the right time. Um, and that's this kind of uh, information with a very tiny ambiguity function in range um, is uh, very necessary to have good estimates there if you're going to do any kind of tracking. Um, so from the man-made standpoint, um, here, here, this is a, a picture of what we kind of see. Um, so if you transmit an FM, um, here's like the ambiguity function for that. It has you know, better resolution and range. Uh, but it's very do Doppler tolerant. So if you have a fast or slow target, it's like, oh, whatever, I don't care how much Doppler shifted because I'll be able to hit it in the match filter. Um, but the problem with putting in more energy is shows up over here um, in this um, presentation from a guy in Oakland State. Um, and that's the range Doppler map of received signal um, using a windowed sign uh, transmit, which isn't great. Um, so what you see is like, um, these are all side lobes from the um, uh, frequency domain, the FFT of the uh, rectangular sine wave, you get those because of the cutoffs. Um, but the important thing is right here, this reverberation ridge, right? Um, so it's zero Doppler. Uh, there's all these rocks and other things out there, um, and they're not moving around, right? Um, in order to form this range Doppler map, you're doing own Doppler nullification if you're a moving platform um, so that things that aren't moving show up at zero and you're not like adding your own relative Doppler onto the thing. Um, and it's really high energy here in close, obviously, because it's going off, this, off to the um, surface and bottom and everything close, plus some volume reverberation coming back. And then this dies off kind of um, not quite exponentially. It's a little bit longer than that, depending on the bottom and everything uh, out there in range. Um, so right here is the target. Um, it has some Doppler, but you can easily see if you took that and shifted it up to zero Doppler, forget it, right? Dude, you're not gonna find it in there. Um, and so um, it's a pretty big blotty target. You see the, the um, range resolution isn't that great, uh, but it's, you know, it, it could be worse. Um, and uh, you know, you do get some Doppler resolution, which helps um, pull it out of there, um, a couple knots, you know, like one or two knots. Um, and so, again, this, this reverb ridge shape is uh, completely determined by your transmit signal, um, and you can see all the side lobes and stuff. Uh, so when you look at the ambiguity function of the bat transmits, uh, it's minimizing a lot of this stuff. Um, and related to the target, here's some... Um, whale and dolphin clicks. Um, and you can relate that to um, the, the target. If you, have a, if you have a pulse, it's uh, this length T sub P, which is um, appreciable compared, its duration is com appreciable compared to the length of the target you're trying to image. Um, what you get back is just a big blob, right? Um, and for classification, um, I would imagine that for, um, if you look at, like, you want to tell a bug from a, a waving leaf, this isn't gonna help you much. Um, but as you make your pulse length much shorter, um, then you're getting um, ambiguity functions that are very sharp in the time domain, um, and that allows you to pull out uh, highlights, glints, uh, of the, the target itself. Um, and as the target moves in time, um, it's changing its orientation with respect to the transmit. 
Um, and so uh, you'll see these highlights come and go. Um, when it's uh, at what's called broadside, um, then you get like one big giant peak. Um, and like I said, I, 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 I can't believe that the, uh, the, the uh, animals aren't using some of that past history to um, help pull out that pattern um, and focus on a certain pattern when you're full of all that clutter and, a re and buried around here in some kind of reverberation ridge. Um, and so these short clicks uh, are really high time bandwidth, right? I mean, it is, it's, a, it's a click, so like, you know, big Fourier series of a direct delta function. Um, <laughs> you need a lot of signs to uh, make that waveform. Full bandwidth, but very short, gives you very good imaging. Um, and uh, same thing with these guys up here. Um, so just kind of to, I, uh, that's a lot of, I mean, there's so much we, we could go on for years about this, well, people have. Um, and I think, you know, the, the interesting thing uh, kind of moving forward for me is to um, kind of start putting hard numbers on things. Um, and I know, um, you know, things like, um, you know, what, just a simple sonar equation analysis in terms of the bat, right? So what are typical target strengths? And, and Rolf's been measuring this, you know, in terms of clutter and, um, you know, I'm sure people looked at various insects and, you know, other targets of interest. Um, but can we model that and model its behavior uh, and maybe create artificial targets that behave the way they should, where their highlight structure changes with orientation? Um, but then um, also, uh, so this spreading, this their spreading loss, you know, R, one over R squared um, on the way out there. Um, and then, you know, so you start with your transmission level and then um, you have your losses. You add a little bit for the target strength because uh, that, comes back um, and then you have the whole round trip loss again um, so you know what are these for bat signals um, and then uh, these guys in terms of noise you know what what's happening there the target one um, that's less that would be like jammers and stuff but you know your self noise reverberation um, just plain ambient noise as well as receiver noise and all that stuff lumped in here you know how well can you detect um, what's basically what is the human sonar equivalent with all the bat numbers plugged in here, right? What's, what, what frequency regimes are we looking at? Uh, what kind of resolutions? Um, and then, you know, run through the whole thing. Uh, look at the resolution of the bat's um, uh, angular separation, and um, Cindy's done a bunch of that work um, on saying, you know, how, if there's two sources next to each other, when, when would the bat go, hey, I know there's two instead of one? Um, angular resolution, um, and then, uh, the time frequency processing, that's really just wavelet uh, wideband processing with the proper ambiguity functions put into it. And then figuring out how they decide to um, uh, say whether it's a target or not. Um, and so, you know, all these things, you know, how are they doing all that? Uh, and what does it mean in terms of the parameters of man-based based sonars? Kind of what's on the, um, on the um, plate for me. Uh, here's a picture um, from some of Jim's work. Um, and Rolf was talking about this as well, is that really wide beam width um, is pretty amazing considering the size of the, you know, when we look at what we have to build and we're nowhere near this kind of coverage, um, it's very, very impressive. Um, so it's got a big to-do list, um, you know, like start looking at these uh, target models for common uh, prey and how they behave and adapt and change with um, angle. Um, do an, a real sonar analysis with Kramer around lower bounds on estimates that you can make um, in terms of these theoretical bounds for um, errors in uh, range estimation, angle estimation, and Doppler estimation from these received waveforms. Um, and then go back and do it all again for re reverb and clutter because uh, it all gets cut, you know, down to <laughs> everything gets really ugly there. Um, and then, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the MIRI project that Rolf and I are part of, then, you know, you got to create these scenarios uh, so, and see how the bats adapt so that we can go back and see, can we make changes um, that help us as well? Um, so anyway, where are we here? Uh, so that's good. I left 10 minutes. I see Rolf is back. Um, if he wants to finish up where he left off, Rolf, any thoughts? 
I think you're oh, muted. Are you back? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm here. Yeah, if, if you would like me to do that, I'm, sure. I'm happy to. Oops. And then if we have questions, Rolf and I get to take them at the end. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. Okay, so okay good. Let, let me share my screen then. Yeah, Mike, you're going to have to stop sharing. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I hit it. There, I hit it. Okay, good. Uh, let me... Okay, so... So sorry for the hiccup. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, so uh, I talked a lot about difficulties. Mike talked a lot about difficulties. So at the, that's maybe good to end on a high note and show you two things that we have been able to do with natural target echoes. And the first is the problem of finding a gap in foliage. So one of my PhD students, Ray Howe, he has built an artificial hedge that you can see here from these plastic vines that you can buy online and let the little cleft here. So you see that our little sonar, bed-like sonar head looking at that in the middle here, there's the hole. And so detecting a hole in, the, in, a, in clutter like that is a difficult problem. But uh, if you're being with this wild, so you can imagine the typical approach for a sonar engineer would be to have a beam that fits into the gap, right? So if you, so up here you see the foliage is the orange thing, the beam is the blue thing, right? So if the beam fits inside of the uh, gap, then you, what you get as you scan along that foliage, and you look at the amplitude that's down here in the left-hand corner, you see this jump down as you go there, and so you can just look at the amplitude and you know there's a gap, right? But as you make the gap narrower compared to the beam, right, that jump down, gets less and less, right? So Rehau has tried using that on, on foliages. And so here's a raw curve, a receiver operating characteristic that he has obtained. So on the x-axis is the false alarms, on the y-axis is the hits. And uh, so in the middle, the diagonal, that would be if you're just guessing. And you see his energy detector performs a lot better than guessing. But if you think about navigation right, in, in an environment, it's not all that good, right? So for example, if you go here, at a false alarm rate of 10%, you would have a hit rate of 50%. So in other words, say you walk down a 100 meter long aisle, and there could be 100 doors, one meter wide. Right? So if you have a false alarm rate of 10%, you would bang your head 10 times walking along that aisle, running into doors that are not there, um, or that are closed, and you would still miss half of your doors. Right? So, so that's not that good. And, but how has been able to use a, a deep uh, learning paradigm, a, a convolutional neural network on the spectrograms, and he got this kind of characteristic here, right? Where you're a lot, lot more into the edge, into the corner, and it means you're performing a lot better, right? So there's actually information in there that we can find that, um, that might make this problem a lot easier, right? And if you look at it here, the spectrograms, right, it looks really hard by right? the top row, is no gap and the bottom row is gap. So you look at it and you say, hmm, there might be nothing, but you know you can find features in there. So that's, that's very interesting. The second problem that we have worked on is landmark identification. And we have used what is a, a, a deep neural network architecture that's called the variational autoencoder. The idea being that you can learn random processes and properties, right? So you have uh, this um, dense neural network here with, with a lot of, uh, elements and uh, we used in this case we use three layers and you match it uh, you map um, the input signal onto a latent layer where again you have random variables that you estimate uh, like a standard deviation and, and the mean and then um, the student who did that Liu Jun he, he used data from the Virginia Tech campus different trails that people walked with a sonar head and then tried to discriminate between these trails so in other words uh, can is there a patchwork right can a bad tell just from listening which part of the campus it is in. Right? And so he did that then using a linear discriminant analysis, so trying to distinguish uh, two different trails for all the different trails. And so here on the right-hand side, you see a matrix sort of how similar or different the trails were. And you see some of them, the high numbers here, they were quite different. Right? So he uses the KL, the kulbach leipzig distance between the distributions to see how different they were. And you see on the left-hand side an example between two trails that were sort of medium separated. Uh, so it, it shows that uh, you can really, in the environment, you can tell between different spots. Some you might confuse, but there is actually a, a, a patchwork there um, that uh, the bats could use. So despite all the randomness in those echoes, you can actually uh, do useful things. And with that, I'll end here and leave the last five minutes for discussion. So thank you very much.
Great, thank you, Rolf. Does anybody have questions for either Rolf or Mike? <laughs> Jim, do you have any questions? Sharon? I have a question. Can I ask over verbal? Oh, there was another question too. We can go with the what? Andrew, do you want to do the ones from chat room? Uh, okay. So um, there's a question from John Buck, and is to Mike. Why do you have wavelets in your system? Are you assuming something about noise properties? Oh, no. It's just um, if there's um, the. The inner product is just a, a, a wavelet transform because it's time scale and delay. That's it. Um, the, the waveforms can be pretty much anything. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, go ahead, Jen. There's nothing else on the chat room. Has anyone looked at how or to what extent bats navigate with passive sonar? I'll just, I'll add to that. That's my question is, um, are they using any soundscape cues? Has anyone looked at that in addition to the active information they are getting from their own sonar? How they integrate that information to maybe get more than what we think about when we're trying to use sonar in human applications to use both components? Good question. Um, we can start collecting some passive soundscape information using a, a, a bat-sized head and recording system and frequency response, and we'll see what happens. With any kind of luck, we will be able to get data in Belize in two weeks. That's a good point, because everybody focuses on the active sonar. Thank you. Part of the problem is that we can't really hear the sounds the bat does, and it's hard to get a real feeling for the richness of the environment. What we have to do is record bat, bat frequencies and then scale the frequencies down and, and move through the environment synthetically more slowly to see if there's something that we can process. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, yeah, I think people consider it well, as an enticing opportunity in, in cases of bat swarms, right? Mm -hmm. So where the swarm would make the soundscape, and yeah. can the animals take advantage of that? Oh, good point. We will do that. Good point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any other questions? Well, great. Thank you to both Mike and Rolf, and thank you for all of you who joined our meeting today. Don't forget May 29th at Brown. Please register. There is no registration fee, but we need to know how many people are coming. And I'll see you guys at the ASA. Chan and I are both coming to the ASA meeting, so we have a chance to talk about stuff. Great. Great. Okay. See you at the ESA. Well, keep me posted on these delay line developments because they're helpful. Yep. Okay? Okay. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great yeah. day. Thank Bye. you, everybody. I should say six people. Oh, God, 26 people of you are on. Great. That is great. Awesome. Six at Brown. Nicole from your lab, right? That was another. There's eleven from your UNH. Yeah. Cool. All right. I'm going to end the recording.